welcome to episode 97 of Real Life Ghost Stories. How you do? To kick things off this week, we need to thank our newest Patreon subscribers. We would like to thank Lynn Rawls, Kelly Logue, Elizabeth Ashley, Catherine Duncan, Megan Crosswell, Leah Librarian, Rosie Day, Kathy Giles, Deesa Turner, Chantel and Amelia Kirby, Brooke and John Hunter, Fiona Haig, Steph Baxter, Mel Howley, Bailey Littleton, Serica, Alex Trustrum Eve, Christina Hallam, Ashley Topperwine Brandeski, Sarah Newman, Amber Carpenter, Christine Kreese, Sarah Beth Nimi George, Kimberly Bush, Scherfendorf, <laughs> Kisa Hargett. Thank you so much for being our Patreon. Yes, thank you so much. Subscribers, we appreciate you so much. And this is going to be our last birthday shout out for quite a while, I think. But it's a really important one because it is to Liam Cosgrove. And Liam listens with his mum all of the time and also with his siblings. So happy birthday, Liam. I hope you have an absolutely gorgeous birthday. Happy birthday to you. And our film review this week, I cannot believe we've done we've not done this film sooner. Our film review is Constantine. Constantine was released in 2005. It has 7 out of 10 on IMDb and 46% on Rotten Tomatoes. Would you like a synopsis? I would love one. Detective Angela approaches Constantine, an exorcist, to help her investigate her twin sister's death. As he digs deeper, he realises a dark conspiracy which could threaten the world. What were your thoughts on this film? As a film, I love it. As a reflection of the comic book series, it has its flaws. See, I don't know anything about the comic book series, so I'm only going based on what I'm seeing on that screen in front of me. And what I'm seeing on that screen in front of me is the holy grail of films. It is what everyone should be searching for when they're looking for a brilliant film. Just for context, if you could see Emma now, she currently looks like she's delivering an impassioned speech to the United Nations. (laughs) I feel like I am. United (laughs) Nations, if you're listening to this and Constantine is what you think will save the world, it will. This film will save the world. It will unite people together. But seriously, okay, so Constantine. Yeah, really like it. I think the actor's... Or the actorship in this, which I don't even think is a word, because it's probably acting, is what I'm yeah, looking probably, for. Yeah, probably. Yeah, is top quality. I love the guy that plays Satan, oh. and I think it's a very good representation of Satan. In fact, I struggle to think of a better representation of Satan on screen that wasn't comical. There's better comical representations of Satan. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> but I do think I'm gonna. Every time I say this, I get messages from people. So I'm going to preface this by saying that I understand that Keanu Reeves is a very good man in real life and they do, that he does loads of charity work and that he is apparently a very unproblematic, nice person. However, I still maintain that he is not a very good actor. OK, and I'm, I'm sorry, please don't don't start sending me messages telling me that he's a brilliant actor and that he gives us money to charity. I can I can look at those things separately. OK, I'm aware he's a very good man, but I, come on. I just, I just feel like, could there have been a better John Constantine? I potentially. I suggest we potentially got the best out of the running because the alternative was Nicolas Cage. Oh my God, was it? Yes. Oh, I take it back. I take it back. Keanu Reeves, <laughs> you can be Constantine any day. Do you know this film has a bit of a bit of everything because it is like the opening is very scary with that possession scene and the family waking up and the girl like in the corner of the room like that is quite frightening but it's also a bit adventurous. like there's the whole spear of destiny thing that's going on there's the like the mystery of her and her twin sister i disagree with you entirely the whole concept of this film is terrifying do you think it's about the son of satan coming back to take the whole entire world over it's about demons that have previously not been allowed to enter earth's sphere coming back to earth to rip up the world I think the concept of it is terrifying. Do you think? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I think the most terrifying part of this film is the fact that you've got the half breeds, the half angels and half demons that are already here. I get it. I get why you think it's like terrifying. But I do see it as more of like an adventure film. 
to take it at face value, whether you believe in heaven and hell, demons and angels or not, let's say you do, the whole storyline is about how dispensable we are. We don't fall into angels or demons. We are the fodder in this story completely. And it's all about destroying us and being put through hellacious landscapes in that way. It's, it's horrible. The concept of it is horrible. I think it's terrifying. The story's not scary. I mean, the film's not as scary as that. But I think if you think about what that storyline is... I clearly pretty. just never thought about it very deeply and just <laughs> thought that Tilda Swinton's really cool because she plays the angel Gabriel and she is the androgynous queen that everyone needs in their life. And I thought the devil was really cool. And like you said, the I would argue the best portrayal of the devil in cinematic bloody history. The cast is amazing. Keanu Reeves is the worst part of the cast. Yes, which is not, that is no. not a bad complaint to have. You've got like bit parts for Shimon Hunsu, who plays Papa Midnight, who's like oh, the bar yeah. owner. He's sensational. You've got, Tilda Swinton being Tilda Swinton and doing Tilda Swinton bits, which is amazing. You've got the guy whose name I've forgotten, who does a really poor, good portrayal of Satan, as I've already said. And you've got Rachel Vice, who actually does a really good job of playing twins. Yeah. And a possessed twin at one point as well. There's so many... Uh, so we're just kind of... This is really chaotic, actually, and we're not, like, wrapping it up neatly. Like, we obviously clearly do every single week, we're you know? Film reviews are neat. But it's just, if you... Matt Toppin from Full Movie Podcast always talks about how at the very at the very core of it, films are about good and evil. And they're about a fight between good and evil in whatever way that's that's dressed up in. And this film is the literal interpretation of the fight between heavenly good and hellish evil. And how that might take place just outside of our viewpoint on Earth. And it's, I think it is a really interesting film. It's its a bit campy. It's its a bit ridiculous at times, but it's so, it's just so enjoyable. And I think it's so underrated. It's massively underrated. I think Keanu Reeves is part of the reason it's underrated. And the reason is, is because it doesn't, it doesn't do the comic justice, which is the reason why a lot of people don't like it because the comic is amazing. It's Alan Moore at his best. And it's about a Liverpudlian detective. And that must be really frustrating if you're yeah. a massive fan of this comic and then they Hollywoodize it in a way that doesn't stay even remotely true to what the original comic was. I get that that's really frustrating. But for somebody like me who has no no experience of the comic, I'm giving this a five. I'm giving it a five star, ladies and gentlemen. Oh my gosh. Five stars for Constantine. I'm giving it four and a half. I haven't got reason to deduct it. I just don't think it's five star worthy. Um, but I do it love is. that scene with the streetlights, which we've mentioned plenty of times before. Yes. So that is that alone is worth the four and a half. I love the scene just before we go of Papa Midnight's club when they go to his club and it's just this dark seedy underworld and it's incredible. Love it. If you've not seen this film, just watch it and enjoy it and embrace it for what it is because it's glorious. Which brings us to our story this week. I have no idea where we're going with this off of that film. We're taking a trip today because we're taking a trip to India. Mm. Like we have said for a very long time to our Indian listeners, we hear you. I, I read the messages where people are going, please do Indian stories. And this is my first step of dipping my toe into an Indian story that took place in 2016. You know, you should have said dipping your toe into the Indian ocean of stories. Oh, I should have. Oh, thank you. You I'm are clearly the creative genius. <laughs> honestly that i need in my life so this story is about the bizarre death of gaurav twari death finds us all eventually sometimes it comes quickly and quietly sometimes it is long drawn out and painful it comes too young and in some sad cases it comes too old there is something very unique about the death of a celebrity in today's modern world. Generally, there is the shock at their demise. Then come the tweets about their best work and people declaring themselves as the biggest fan. And in some cases, there are the conspiracy theories that go along with it. After the initial shock of Michael Jackson's death, for example, there were the murmurs of secret goings on. Was he really dead at all? Was he murdered? And did anybody see the video of his ghost on YouTube? 
There have been similar conversations surrounding other deaths too, like Brittany Murphy, JFK, Marilyn Monroe, and the list seems endless. In celebrity culture, we pick apart the lives of the individual. So it is inevitable that we end up picking apart their death too. But what happens when a known ghost hunter dies in mysterious circumstances? Do we assume that they had meddled too much in the world of the unknown? Or is that just a juicy story to satiate our desire for the darker side of human life? This story begins and ends in India with paranormal investigator Gaurav Twari. We often fail to grasp just how big India is. It's home to over one billion people and lives atop its own tectonic plate. It has a rich culture that is both seductive and mystical to those on the outside. Like many countries, it has experienced vast atrocity, often under colonial rule. And with a population so large and a history so rich, it has a folklore and a mysticism that can be both bizarre and truly terrifying. With folklore that runs deep in a country's cultural identity, often comes certain reverence and respect for the paranormal. Gaurav Twari was born in 1984 to Hindu parents. He knew from a young age that he was destined for fame, and he had dreams of Bollywood and becoming a famous actor. Many of us have those dreams in childhood, And then we outgrow them as time goes on. But Gaurav didn't. He stuck steadfastly to his desire to be an actor and landed some minor roles in TV shows and adverts when he left school. These small roles led to bit parts in feature-length cinematic releases and he felt sure that he was on the cusp of his big break. But as with many who are chasing the dream of fame, it was not to be and Gaurav realised that he probably needed to start considering other career options. His other passion was aircraft. And strangely, it would be his pursuit of this passion that would lead to his eventual fame and success. He moved to the USA at the age of 21 in order to train as a pilot, and therefore completely change his career trajectory. While training for his pilot's licence, Gaurav was moved into an apartment with his friends and this simple, necessary and seemingly innocuous move ended up changing his life forever. It wasn't long after they moved into the apartment that they began to notice odd occurrences. All of the housemates would notice objects moving around on their own. They would hear both indecipherable whispers and full disembodied voices Doors would open and shut, and later they would see shadow people moving and darting in their peripheral vision. Prior to this, there is no evidence that Gorev had any vested interest in the paranormal. But this experience completely fascinated him. While his housemates lived in fear, it seemed that the experiences had a profound effect on Gorev, and he had an insatiable curiosity to try and figure out what was happening in the world that we just couldn't see. He later went on to speak about his experiences on Haunting Australia, a TV show on sci-fi, where he was portrayed as a fearless investigator who was well respected in the field. Is there anyone with me who would like to show himself? I would like you to come forward and show yourself to me. I was a person who never believed in ghosts and spirits or any existence of paranormal. I was training to become a commercial pilot 2006 and I was given an apartment by my flight school but something happened to me we started witnessing things like poltergeist activity we started hearing whispers and we could not find anyone there who was doing that it really challenged my belief system I started looking into paranormal research and slowly gradually I came across so many things in life that could really make me understand about nature of spirits When I went back to India in 2009, I established India's first paranormal organization called Indian Paranormal Society. 
Gorov continued his aviation training, while simultaneously trying to rationalise and understand the phenomena that was happening in his home. He eventually passed his training, becoming a fully-fledged pilot, and also received certification from the U.S. Paranexis Association as a lead investigator. He went on to become the official Indian representative for the Paranexis Association, and upon returning to India in 2009, he set up the Indian Paranormal Society, with the intention of trying to help those whose lives were being negatively impacted by suspected paranormal afflictions. By all accounts, he was a very busy investigator. This was the first official society of its kind in India. And India is a vast expanse with a huge population. And business was booming. At one point, the Indian Paranormal Society was receiving at least 250 emails and 500 phone calls every single day from different people desperate for help. And Gaurav ended up having to hire staff in order to try and meet the demands and the needs of the people. And then came MTV Girls' Night Out. When I first read this part of the story, I was completely confused. There seemed to be no conceivable thread between Gaurav starting the Indian Paranormal Society and appearing on an MTV show which sounds like a cross between Geordie Shore and Bad Girls Club. The real mystery of this story might be why in the world MTV named a TV show Girls' Night Out when it was actually a very serious show where people returned to the scene of their paranormal experience and recounted it on camera. Because of the overwhelming response to the Indian Paranormal Society, television requests quickly began to pour in for Gaurav. He was young, good-looking, he was a paranormal investigator who travelled India helping families in need, and he was the perfect fodder for television. Girls' Night Out opened many doors for Gaurav, and he then appeared on a very popular TV drama documentary series called Bootaya, where spine-tingling real-life experiences of ordinary people were explored, and Gaurav and others acted as lead investigators who tried to find rational explanations for the events. To be honest, it really sounds like it was revolutionary, as the point was to find the human psychological reason behind our belief in ghosts and the things that we experience. It ran for 23 episodes. That then led him to join the Haunting Australia team, where paranormal experiences are investigated by a team from all over the world. He was clearly well respected, and even now the YouTube comments remember him as being completely fearless, eternally curious and thorough, using his quest for knowledge to overcome his fears. He also at various points demonstrated his other skills, including hypnotising a colleague who had a morbid fear of horses. Eventually, however, the show was cancelled and Gaurav returned to the Indian Paranormal Society to continue his investigations. He agreed to take a case, which seemed unusually dark. A family living in the Janakpuri neighbourhood of West Delhi had been driven from their home by something malevolent, something that seemed evil. Whatever this entity was, it had committed such extreme acts of violence that the family were not safe to stay at home anymore. On the 6th of July 2016, Gaurav investigated the house. And the next day, he would be dead. When he returned home that night after the investigation, it was about 2am. And Gaurav's wife, Aria, was waiting up for him. And she was not happy. She was sick and tired of Gaurav's lifestyle and the continuous investigating and travelling around. She just wanted him to have a nice, stable 9-to-5 job so that they could properly settle down and start a family. They were currently living together with his parents and that night, after the argument, slept in separate beds. The next morning, the pair awoke and resolved their differences. They were both frustrated with the fast-paced lifestyle and the late nights, but Gaurav was genuinely dedicated to his work. He sat at the kitchen table drinking coffee and answering emails, 
and at 11am he went for a shower. While he showered, Aria and her father-in-law were watching television and they heard a thud from upstairs. Neither of them really took any notice, but after a few minutes Aria decided to check on Gorav just in case. As would be expected, the bathroom door was locked from the inside. But she was suddenly gripped with a sense of deep-rooted fear as she realised that there was a complete and eerie silence from the other side. There was no shower, there was no water, there was no shuffling. There was no answer to her questions. She knocked. And then she pounded. And eventually her and her father-in-law burst into the room to find Gorav on the floor, writhing and grasping his neck with his eyes bulging. He couldn't breathe and he was rushed to hospital where he eventually died. Gorav died with a thin black mark around his neck that was not there before and could not be explained. Some of his friends quickly took to social media to say that he had died of a heart attack, but this was not true. The official medical examination said that he had died of asphyxiation and the official police statement reported that Gorav had committed suicide and that he had died by hanging. Except that there are problems with this. Firstly, there was nothing in the bathroom that could have caused the injuries he sustained. There were no wires, there was no shower curtain. And when his family found him writhing on the floor and clutching his neck, there was nothing that they could see around his neck, which perhaps prompted the initial assumption that he had died of a heart attack. But yet there it was. A thin black line wrapped right around his neck. But the story doesn't end there. In the weeks leading up to his death, Gorath and his father had had a very peculiar experience. They seemed to have been very close. I mean, they lived together. And in the police investigation that followed his death, Gorath's father relayed everything that had happened. Gorath had come to him and told him that he was being followed by an evil entity. He had never spoken like this before. And in an official statement of his death on the US Paranexis Association website, they asserted that ideas about physical harm being caused by spirits completely went against Gorav's ideology. He didn't believe that spirits had the ability to physically harm humans. In fact, he believed that spirits came from humans that we created them in our belief of them. His dad, therefore, was shocked by Gorav's claim that he was being followed by something. He went on to say that he could feel the presence watching him wherever he went, and he felt as though whatever it was was getting closer to him. His father was obviously worried for his son's well-being, but not because of the evil entity, but rather because of a fatherly okay, you need to slow down now, kind of way. You need to have a rest. And that was until his father actually saw it. One morning, Gorav was in the kitchen, and him and his father were chatting while Gorav was making himself something to eat. His dad glanced up at him, and what he saw made his blood turn to ice. While Gorav was bustling around, there... Not five feet away from him stood a shadow figure, black and looming. His father was so shocked that he could not even speak. Later, at dinner, while all the family were together, Gorav made a seemingly bizarre announcement, but that now made so much sense for the family. He told his mother and his wife of the entity, and told him that he was now growing more and more concerned for his own safety. He said that the entity was going to try and kill him, and that if they found him with a thin black mark around his neck, it would mean that the entity had gotten him. 
they didn't understand at the time and were obviously worried for his well-being. But now, to them, it all makes sense. Now there's a couple of ways that we can look at this story. Was Gorav subconsciously using the alleged entity as a metaphor for his own depression or even suicidal thoughts? Maybe he didn't know how to talk about it and this was the easiest way. Was he a troubled man that committed suicide? Lots of people in the conversation around this story used the excuse that Gorav had everything going for him. So why in the world would he commit suicide? But that's not how suicide works, unfortunately. And not everybody who's going to commit suicide leaves clues that they're going to do so. But there was no evidence in the room at all that it was a suicide attempt. But then, was he murdered for some reason by his family? Have they gotten away with it? Or was it something more sinister? Whatever happened to Gorav, he was a young man that was taken much too early and who devoted his life to the relentless pursuit of the paranormal. In all honesty, this story has me shook. It's horrible. There's not, there's too much, too many gaps in the information. I'm not a fan of this in the, I like it as a story, but it's really unnerved me. It's quite unsettling, isn't it? It's really unsettling because it's odd. It's really strange. You've got that look in your eye like you're going to spoil this. No, I don't have have anything to add. The house that he investigated before he died, was that for a show or just for the society? No, no, that was for his society. No, it wasn't filmed. There was no... And this is the thing. Apparently, he visited like 6,000 haunted locations while he was investigating. So that will just show you how prolific he was and how busy he was. And the par- Paranexis, whatever they're called, those that association, I, I went onto their website to see if they had written anything about his death, and they did. And they specifically wrote about, they asked people who knew him just to not post about it on social media. And they said they didn't believe it was a suicide, but that speculation is unhealthy. And that the other thing he definitely didn't believe in was that spirits had the capacity to harm you. Because obviously... You know, the gossip was rife about whether or not this was, he had been, you know, he'd messed with the wrong entity, essentially. That I just, I generally don't like it. I am finding it hard to talk about because it's really unsettled me. I think it's the thought of the fact that he's almost stalked, isn't he, by whatever this is. And I guess if you've done over, and, and the thing that gets me about this story is that he's clearly in it, involved in this to help people. He's done bits and bobs on TV, but he keeps returning to it for this society doesn't he now i'm sure there was some sort of compensation for it but it doesn't sound to me like he was trying to do it and i'm I'm sorry for saying this sack but we all know this is true he wasn't doing it for his own ego no and what's really interesting so i i watched clips of him and it it's really weird to think like i didn't know anything about him before i'd never seen a tv show with him on it but watching the clips of him is really fascinating because you can see that he just enjoys it and he is genuinely really earnest. There's none of this like hyperbole. There's no like running around. There's no, dude, oh my God, did you see that? And everything is methodical and he takes pictures and there is an absolutely, I'll leave the link in the description, but there's a glorious moment in Haunting Australia where they go to some, I think it's an asylum and they do the thing where, you know, they put somebody into the morgue chiller and one of them is like, I can't go in. He's like, I can't, I can't do it. You know, I've got all this feelings and energy and I won't survive if I go in there. And it's all very dramatic. And then literally Gorav in a wheelchair because he's hurt his leg is like, hey, I'll do it. And he is cool as a breeze and goes in for like an hour and a half. And he's like, yeah, I'm fine. And he says the line, knowledge is the thing to combat fear. And I was like, wow, that's really interesting. So I really felt from watching him that it was something that he was genuinely passionate about and wanted to try and understand and wanted to help people. So that's why this story is, I mean, it is really sad. It's unsettling as well. I just feel like it's, you go to so many houses to help people and obviously he's had a lot of experience, but maybe this is where the formal training of exorcists comes into play. And actually you don't know 
how much or what he picked up in all those different visits. But there's also the argument that just because they can't quite figure out how he died doesn't mean he didn't die not supernaturally. I don't mean of natural causes because his death may have been a murder orchestrated by somebody. So just because they can't quite figure out how it happened doesn't mean that it didn't, that that it was a paranormal case, you know? There's a big disparity between, so the medical record or the medical examination said he died of asphyxiation, but they didn't say he died of suicide. But the police, because they needed to say something, I guess, the only logical explanation they could think of was that, was to say he died of asphyxiation, therefore it must have been a suicide. According to reports, there was absolutely no evidence in that bathroom that he had attempted suicide and nothing that they could find that would make that mark on his neck. Yeah, which is why it's unsettled me. (laughs) But I also think that he wasn't, potentially he wasn't the only person with access to that bathroom. And there was obviously a police investigation which shows no evidence of that. There was no evidence of um of like a break in, or and and I, apparently their flat their the apartment they lived in was like an open plan apartment, so you couldn't like get into the apartment without somebody else seeing you. So the like because the police in their investigation questioned the his dad and his wife obviously because they were the ones at home, so they thought, "Have you done this to him?" And they were satisfied that the father and the wife didn't do anything. But nobody can quite figure out what happened. Aren't you just a little bit intrigued as to what went on in that house? Yeah, I'm very intrigued. It's bizarre. I'm still really unsettled by it. You you haven't helped me at all. Sorry, I didn't mean to unsettle you this much. It's just... It's I haven't just, unsettled you this much in a very long time, I think. There's just too much... There's too little information around it. I want to know what... I want to know what was going on in the build-up to... In the point between him talking to his family about this this entity up to his death there's like we've only got a little bit of information and so my my imagination is filling in the gaps which i think is why i'm so unsettled by it (laughs) the other side of it is is that if say if the dad and the wife and i i kind of went in and out of believing this say if they colluded and killed him for whatever reason i don't really understand what the benefit of what the benefit of that would be why, after the police had ruled it as a suicide, would the dad then continue or or try and perpetuate this story that no, no, it was it was something something got him, something dark got him? There'd be no reason he'd just be like, okay, yeah, it was a suicide. Yeah, and because we all it's move not on. like he's trying to get off, is it? Like, yeah, so, they haven't accused him of no. it. So, what's the benefit of perpetuating it? It's just like, I guess, in truly logical mind, you could argue that there's probably still people that have suspicion on him and so it's just a case of i didn't i didn't read in any of the reports that there was suspicions of foul play in in like the there doesn't seem to be any disturbance and i guess you know he's a young relatively healthy man if somebody tried to kill him there would have been some sort of disturbance in terms of something be knocked over or he would have tried to fight back you would imagine take it with a pinch of salt i guess but it's just knowing the detail of how he's going to go says that what he's saying is is true or that he's not very well and neither of them is particularly nice and I don't know which is worse actually <laughs> I think the thing is if he'd completed suicide you can't hide something when she, once you're dead so there would have been some kind of evidence of a rope or something like that to have caused that line do you know what I mean unless he'd yeah. like drawn it on in Sharpie beforehand I think they would have known yeah when they did the tests Absolutely. I guess they would have figured and it out and that's what really just confuses me about it I guess it's like something caused that line to happen and he'd already said that that was the way that he was going to go. So he'd either pre-planned it and he's found a way of creating that mark on himself and then somehow being able to not give away how he did it, which is Houdini levels of magic. And especially if, I mean, this is very dark, but if your ultimate goal is to die, are you really going to, you know, try and hide the fact because it doesn't really matter to you? Yeah. Yeah. So it's just, it's a very straight, the more you think about it, the more it bends your mind, I think. And it's just, it's just so, he's being hunted, isn't he? It just get it just creates depression of being hunted, even though it's only over a week. And like, like the context that you've given, I'm, I'm not accusing you of lying, but the context that you've given suggests that it's not something that he talks about at home. So it's, he's felt scared enough to talk to his father about it and then I to think, announce it to his wife and mother as well. I think that what I was trying to get at was, was that he didn't believe that spirits could physically harm mm. people, so he had no reason to be frightened. I think that's that's why his dad was shocked, was so, that he's, he was suddenly like, 
something's what, what are you talking about you never talk about stuff like this so what changed in the build up to that conversation a part of me a big part of me thinks that very sadly it was probably a mental health issue and potentially he did complete suicide but I can't wrap my head around how the the dark entity following him does feel metaphorical right yeah apart from his dad seeing it apart from then his dad claiming to have seen it I mean but I think people talk about dark auras around people as well though don't they yeah, and I wonder if his dad was just maybe not able to come to terms with it. I just don't know. I'm so baffled. See, nine times out of ten, I lean towards your logic in reality, even though I might say something else, because, you know, it's a lot less scary than thinking about the other option. But this one just doesn't sit right with me. It just doesn't sound right. There's too many creepy elements to it. I think we need opinions on this one. Hmm. From from the audience. Don't give any to me. Just tell them to Emma. Yeah, let me know what you think. <laughs> I I think it's a very sad case. I think oh, it's it is sad regardless. Oh isn't yeah. It? Either way, it's sad. <laughs> Sorry, that's not. I don't mean. <laughs> I don't mean like other people don't think it's sad. It's a terrible case. I think that potentially because of what he did for a living, people might be reading too much into it. But I don't know. It's not. I mean, I don't know how his dad managed the grief. Who knows? I need more information. I can't. I can't stomach this as it is with all these gaps because it's just too mysterious. What information do you need? I need to know what happened. I need to know what caused the change in Psyche and I need to know what was going on in the house. I need to know about this house in West Delhi. I need to know what it Well, what you it know was. what that means. We need to make a trip. No, oh, I don't need to know that much. To that house in <laughs> no, West Delhi. That was what I was saying. <laughs> so if you enjoyed this week's episode... You can find everything that you need to know about us on reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com. You can find our email address to send your own stories to. You can find the links to all of our social medias. You can find the link to our Patreon where for $5 a month you get access to over 70 bonus episodes. And for $2 a month you get access to over 25 bonus episodes. What a world we live in. I'm sorry that I've stressed you out so much. Can I just say, because I didn't feel appropriate when we were talking about it, but I'd like to just drop this now. Yeah. What on earth were MTV thinking about naming that program Girls Not Out? I, I honestly was like, when I saw that, I thought that he had gone on to some like reality yeah, TV yeah, yeah, show. Yeah. And I was like, which, oh. That's, which is odd, but yeah, fine. Be, yeah. Especially if he was wanting to become famous. Like he yeah, wanted to yeah, be yeah. an actor. He wanted yeah, to be yeah. on, on TV or, or whatever it was. So why would you call a Girls Not Out? Yeah, it's such an inappropriate name. Because then I, I read it and I got most of my information for this episode from a video which I've linked in the description. And even they were like this really serious, like highbrow, yeah. w- incredibly well-researched video were like the inappropriately named what? MTV's what Girls Night thinking? Out. It's literally, and it's really dark. Like, because I looked up the um, Bootaya TV show as well mm. to get a synopsis. And that looks brilliant like i was i was like i'm here for this tv show because a boot i think it's b-h-o-o-t is like a a, a paranormal like a folklorish creature from okay. um so i'm sure we'll discuss that another from, episode. <laughs> yeah from indian folklore um and i don't know what the aya stands for so if you were if you're listening and you know can you can you let me know but it sounded like a really good tv show and then it was like mtv's girls night out what did he, and I thought I was like, was it a dating show? Like, yeah, what was what it? it but, and nope. that would have been fine. Like, if he'd, yeah. if he'd have gone on it and it would have been a reality show, fine. Like, even it's a bit bizarre, but you yeah, know, fine. That, People do it. Like, but why name a show that's about that? I have no idea. <laughs> I'm gonna have to try and find the show and watch it. I want to speak to the executives at MTV. I need yeah. to know the decision beyond that. And then it's not <laughs> even like Girls Night Out where. Like it was a spoof paranormal thing where they scare groups of girls or something. Like, you know, those like stupid scenarios people set up. Yeah. No, no, it was people recounting their paranormal experiences, going back to visit the place where and they telling were the story. Stiff. Yeah. yeah. That's what? not an appropriate Doesn't make sense. Oh. Doesn't make sense. So ridiculous. I don't, I don't know. I didn't understand it. And on that note, we shall see you next week. Bye.